Hey, go ahead and grab your Bibles and open up to Daniel chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible that you feel like you can read and understand, grab the paperbacks from the ends of the rows, open up to page 725. We'll get there in a little bit. My name is Curtis Teal. I'm our Twinsburg Macedonia campus minister. Yes. And love getting to come up here and hang out with you guys about every other week or so. So today we're continuing on in our I Believe in Monsters series. Uh, and uh, today we're talking about a monster that uh, I'm excited to talk about because I, I feel like we've probably been exposed to at least this word. Maybe we've never even uh, known exactly what kind of monster it is. But today we're talking about ghouls. And as a kid, um, one of the places I, I personally, I love to tell stories. And I think one of the places where I began to fall in love with that was uh, at our media day in elementary school. Uh, and man, I feel like I'm really loud again. I'm sorry, everybody. I've talked quietly. So we whisper. It's the whisper sermon. Um, so uh, our media day, so, uh, we would go, every Friday, we would get to go to the media center and we would check out books. We get to check out books and magazines and, and, and things like that. And then, but the one time a month, that I remember the most, that I remember my, like, our elementary school librarian for, it was in October she did something special. In October, we'd come in the Friday before Halloween, and she'd have the whole media center decorated for Halloween. She'd have streamers hung up and pumpkins and like spiders and spider webs. And instead of going around and checking out like magazines and books, we would gather the chairs on one side of the media center, and we would all gather around this cassette tape player. And, that's like a CD player, like MP3s before all that. Yeah, yeah. what's an MP3? Really? We're at that now? Uh, but we, so we'd gather around, and on this tape, every year we listened to the same tape. It was a collection of like 10 spooky stories. And, and I just fell in, that was where I began to fall in love with telling stories, because like, I don't need a picture to look at, just by the way someone shares and, and kind of creates a vision, and they change the cadence of their voice, and how, how loud or how soft they speak, they could create this anticipation, uh, and they could make a jump, or you could feel the excitement of when the hero conquers the villain, or the kind of like, what's going to happen next, when you don't know for sure what's the next part of the story, and I fell in love with sharing these stories because of this spooky tape that we listened to, and as I started thinking back through that, I can remember vividly several of the stories that were on this cassette tape. One of which is there's a lady, she's driving and she's heading home and she's, you know, kind of like an abandoned like farmland and there's a truck that follows behind her and just kind of really rides up on her, on her tail and is putting his high beams on and she gets scared, she pulls into her driveway and the man jumps out of the truck and he tells her that there was a man, there was another man in her car that was trying to stab her from the back seat and I remember thinking to myself, who signed off on t saying this to kids, you know? <laughs> Like here we were in elementary school, and I, and I know we listened to the same tape. I can, because I memorized the stories so much, that we at least listened to the tape three times. So who signed off on telling a fourth grader this story about a dude hiding in the back seat, ready to kill this woman driving? Like, what in the who? Why would you do that? And today's Bible story is kind of similar to that. You know, this is a favorite one that we love to share with kids. But when you sit back and you kind of look at the story, like, it's pretty spooky. You're like, why do we love to tell this to, to our children? And so anyways, that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, this morning we're talking about a ghoul. And like most modern monsters in folklore history, uh, I think we've probably already heard of, but maybe we haven't seen it in, you know, in culture everywhere, is the ghoul. And this is what you get. If you were to go do a Google search on ghoul, this would be one of the first images that pop up. And what has become the the, the myth has kind of morphed over the years. And in Western folklore, a ghoul is a monster that lives in a cemetery and it goes and it digs up the graves of freshly buried bodies. It eats the body and then it steals whatever it's been buried with. All right. Pretty intense. But that's actually not the ghoul that we're looking at. Originally, when ghouls pop up in folklore history is in Middle Eastern folklore. So a Middle Eastern ghoul, where they first pop up, is around the area of Mesopotamia. And originally, originally, a ghoul was a shape-shifting creature. It could shape, uh, shift its shape into any form. Got to be careful saying that one. 
Uh, it, it, it could shapeshift into any creature, and what it would do is it would reside just kind of off an abandoned desert road. You see, because during this time period with Mesopotamia, it, would take, it, was, it was kind of a big deal to travel from one place to another. It could take you often more than just one night to get to the next city or to get to the next village. And so often what you do is you load down kind of your cart, you know, your wagon, whatever you're, you're taking, and then you would often have to camp on the road. And so what these ghouls would do is they would reside just off, just off the safety of the road, and they would usually try and use something attractive to try and lure you off the safe path of the road so that they then could kill you, eat you, devour you, and then they would take what's yours. And see, and if that's not bad enough, I mean, because that's pretty, you know, that's pretty crazy, but if that's not bad enough, they would also then, because they were shapeshifters, shape shift into your form they would start looking like you so that if loved ones came looking for you they could then lure them off the path and devour them as well and so often they'd use things that looked like safety you're traveling on an abandoned desert road they'd light a fire just kind of out uh, out past the safety part of the road so you're traveling by yourself you're like think Oh, look, it gets cold at night. They've already got a fire going. There's a fire going, so that means there's people over there. We can band together and stand up against robbers or against hyenas, whatever's going to come after us. I'll leave the safety of the road to go be with those people, not knowing that it was really a shape-shifting ghoul that just wanted to devour you and take what's yours. So here's the bottom line for ghouls, because these guys are nasty. Ghouls want to get you distracted. So they can devour you and then take what's yours. That's what this monster wants to do. It wants to distract you so it can devour you and then take what's yours. Just kind of like what that girl was singing in the video. Mother said, come what may, don't you stray. Mother said, straight ahead, don't be misled. In Proverbs 4, verses 25 through 27, there's some really good wisdom that I think helps us Resist the ghouls in our own lives. It reads like this. It says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the path for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. The next verse, do not turn to the right. Don't turn to the left, but keep your foot from evil. Today's Bible story is one of those ones that it's like, oh man, who signed off on Tell This to Kids? But I got to give you a little bit of background before we jump into it. This is a story out of the Old Testament. So what that is, is that's like the pre-Jesus part of the Bible. And so this is in a totally different time period that, that, that we can understand. It probably took place somewhere around 500 B.C., and that was when the Persian Empire was like the biggest, strongest empire. So it's a totally different world. The Persian Empire is a very violent society. And so the story uh, that we read during this time period are often very violent. And a lot of the stories in the Old Testament, the pre-Jesus part, consists of like a main character who's our main person who's living in a society who's living in a culture that wants nothing to do with God and and so there's usually just that one person that one family group that one main character is trying to follow God but in a society that really has no regard for following God and so it's really kind of some extreme stuff that we read And such is the case in this story out of Daniel, about a prophet, a messenger from God named Daniel. And here's how this brutal story starts out. Daniel 6, starting in verse 1, it reads like this. And we're going to go back through, we're going to read a whole big chunk of it, and then we'll go back and kind of explain what some of it means throughout there. So Daniel 6, starting verse 1, reads like this. It said, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Verse 3. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Here's what's going on in these first three verses. So Daniel is a Jewish man, and that's key, and we'll get to that in a second. The main characters are a guy named Daniel and King Darius. And then these governors. King Darius is the king of this Persian empire at the time. And he's trying to kind of establish his control because his empire kind of is continuing to expand. 
And as it's continuing to expand, he realizes, man, I've got this huge, vast empire. I need to do something to make sure that I'm getting the money that's mine. I need to make sure that people are paying the appropriate taxes, that I'm getting the riches, that I'm getting the money that I'm supposed to get, and that people understand I'm in control, I'm in power here. He says, man, but this is a huge empire. There's no way I can do all this by myself. So he appoints what they call 120 satraps. For them, that's like their word for governors. That's essentially what he appoints, is 120 governors to be over these provinces to report back to him and make sure that he's getting the money and he's getting the power that he's supposed to get. Do you understand what's going on? So he then realizes, wow, 120 governors, that's still a lot of people to try and report to me. I've got to do something to kind of make that a little easier. So he appoints three administrators that those 120 governors will then report to, and then those three administrators will come report to him. One of those administrators is this Jewish guy, this Jewish prophet named Daniel, the guy who's trying to follow God and live out the things he wants him to live out. And the rub is they had conquest. They had taken over the Jewish people. And so for these 120 governors who had probably been a part of the empire for a while, for all of a sudden King Darius to say, hey, here's this Jewish man, and I want him to be in charge of you because they had just conquered the Jewish empire, for them, it was probably like an insult. Because they were like, oh, this, this guy, we just conquered him. He shouldn't be my boss. If anything, he should be rotten in one of my prisons somewhere. He definitely shouldn't be my, my boss. If anything, he should, at the bare minimum, be one of my servants. And you're making him my boss? Like, they took kind of offense at that. Because they had just conquered him. But Daniel was so good at what he did. And the king notices that, the, that Daniel is really good at what he did, so much so that it says at the end of verse 3 that the king recognized that Daniel was so good that eventually he planned to turn over the whole kingdom to Daniel. And that's where they begin to take offense at this. They want, these governors want what's Daniel's. They want to take what's Daniel's. And so here's what happens in verse 4. At this... At the fact, at the fact that they, we were going to turn the whole kingdom over to Daniel, at this, the administrators and the satraps, the governors, they tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and he was neither, uh, there was, he was neither corrupt nor was he negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And so these governors sit back, and they want what's Daniel's. They want to take from Daniel what's his. They want to distract him. They want to devour him, and they want to take what's his. And so they sit back, and they watch him, and they just wait they just wait for him to be negligent. They just wait for him to mess up, to miscount something. But he doesn't because he's really good at his job. And so they think, well, okay, if he's not going to mess up, well, then we're going to sit around and we're going to wait because sooner or later he's going to get jealous. Sooner or later he's going to want to take some riches for himself. So they sit back and they watch Daniel and they wait to find some corruption in him. But he's a good, honest man. And so once again, they don't ever see it. And they, they, they recognize, all right, if he's not going to be negligent, and he's not going to be corrupt. How are we going to take what's his? The only way, the only way that we could distract him, the only way that we would be able to trip him up is if we put something in between him and his God. And so that's what they decide to do. They, next, here's what happens. They go to the king, verse 6. So these administrators and satraps, they went as a group to the king, and they said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, the prefects, the satraps, the advisors, and governors all have agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Verse 8. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. So here's what happens. They realize the only way we're going to be able to trip Daniel up is to put something in between him and his God. So they go to the king, 
And they go, they go to the king, and I mean immediately from the beginning. I mean, you just, they're just schmoozing him from the beginning. You're like, oh, come on. May King Darius live forever. It's like, you guys don't care. And so, may King Darius live forever. And then they continue on in this, this speech to kind of set it up. And they say, hey, uh, king, hey, here we are, your 120 governors. You remember us? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. You know, awesome empire, man. Thank you for using us, putting us in charge. Uh, so, uh, so we were all talking, king. And um, we really think, to help you establish your power, one of the things that we think you should do is you should make a decree that anybody who prays to any human being or any god over the next 30 days should be thrown in the lion's den. And King Darius is like, oh yeah, that sounds like a great idea. A couple really weird things. First off, the lion's den, like this is a thing, right? Like, normally kings are like, off with his head, you know, and it's done. King Darius is like, feed him to my lions, you know. Like, this is, this is something that they do. It, there is a the lion's den. It's not like a lion's den. Hey, let's go find a lion's den somewhere. So the lion's den. This is something that they do. And they say to King Darius, King Darius, make a decree that anybody who prays will be, that anyone but you be thrown into the lion's den. It seems super evil, right? seems maniacal, and it is. Let's, let's call it what it is. But remember the time period in which this is going on. The kings right now, I mean, are in the business of establishing power and lording it over people. And so this is right up King Darius's alley. And so when they come and they suggest this to him, he probably spent about as much time thinking about the ins and outs of this decree as we do when we accept the terms of use on our iPhone, Right? <laughs> I mean, that thing could say, hey, we're going to take all your money. Would be, but we would be like, uh, yeah, but Snapchat, so, you know? I mean, this, and so this is, I mean, this is right up his alley. I mean, we don't read the terms of service. King Darius probably didn't read or think about, even though he really likes Daniel, didn't think about what this meant for the... He just heard, hey, establish your power. And he's like, yes, let's do it. So he signs it into a decree, and it becomes law. The only way they knew they could trip up Daniel was to put in him in a no-win situation. He's either going to break his conviction and not pray to God, or he's going to get thrown in the lion's den. Either way, these guys, when they distract him, to devour him and take what's his. And then verse 10 happens. Now, when Daniel had learned that the decree had been published... He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. Daniel chose to stay focused. He didn't get pulled off to the right. He didn't get pulled off to the left. He kept going straight ahead. He stayed focused. He stays consistent. And he prays to God, says, just as he had always done. And then verses 11 through 16, I'm just going to kind of summarize for you. And so I don't know if all the governors go outside and they gather outside of Daniel's house, but Daniel goes upstairs, he gets down in front of his window, he kneels in the window that faces towards Jerusalem, and he prays three times a day, just as he had always done, and the governors watch him. It'd be kind of a weird thing, right? Look out your window, there's 120 people watching, like, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? And he does it. And he does it. And so they all get up. And they go back to King Darius and, hey, King Darius, hey, remember a couple days ago we were all in here and we told you about establishing your power and you're like, yeah, and so we told you to make this decree. And did you make a decree saying that nobody should pray to anybody but you over the next 30 days? And King Darius is like, I sure did. And then they were like, well, King Darius, you know that guy Daniel you like so much? Well, yeah. Well, we just saw him praying. And King Darius gets distressed. It's crazy. He gets so distressed. It says that, that he was determined to find a way to save Daniel before the end of the day. And he becomes distressed about his buddy Daniel, that Daniel's now going to be thrown in the lion's den, and he tries to find a way to save Daniel from the lion's den, but the governors remind him, King, you made this decree to establish your power. If all of a sudden you, you go back on that, I mean, all havoc's going to break loose. Like, you have to follow through, and you have to send Daniel to the lion's den. And so King Darius gives the order to throw Daniel into the lion's den. And the king had one thing to say to Daniel as he's being thrown into the den. He simply says this at the end of verse 16. King Darius says to Daniel, may the God, may your God, 
whom you serve continually rescue you. And they roll a stone in front of the den and they seal it in such a way so that they know in the next morning when they wake up, they can tell if someone pulled that stone away so Daniel could get out and then maybe run back in the morning before uh, they have you know, a chance to get there. And what I think is really interesting about the story is when you go and you read the story, like verse 18, here's what happens verse 18. It says, the king returned to his palace. So Daniel's been thrown in the lion's den, rock's been put in front of it, it's been sealed, and he's got to make it the night. And it says this, then the king returned to his palace and he spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. The king is in a king's palace, in a king's bed, with a king's menu, and King's entertainment, and he's the one that has the sleepless night. Daniel is stuck in a pit that probably smells. It's dark. It's got flesh, rotting bones all around because this is something that they did, apparently. And King Darius is the one who has the sleepless night. Like, to me, that's amazing. And because King Darius can't sleep, the first crack of light he wakes up, or he gets up out of his bed, and he runs, he runs to the den, and he runs to the den. He stands on the outside of the rock, and he shouts to Daniel, Daniel, has the God whom you serve continually been able to save you? And from the other side of the rock, Daniel yells back, yep. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, and King Darius, may this serve as evidence to you that I did nothing wrong against you. And so they roll the stone back and they pull Daniel out of the pit and it says that he doesn't even have a scratch on him. And because King Darius gets upset at the governors who tried to trip up and take away his best servant, King Darius has the other governors thrown into the lion's den and it says that the lions pounce on them before they even hit the ground. We don't tell that part to the children. <laughs> And that's where you're like, who signed off on telling this one to kids? Here's the deal. I believe in ghouls. And they may not be actual mythological folklore creatures that lure you off an abandoned desert road, but there are plenty of people and things that want to distract us, to devour us, and take the good that God wants for us. I believe in ghouls. Things and people that distract us from the path of good and God. Those are ghouls. When you go back and you look at the details of Daniel's story, the reason Daniel is able to continually stand up and push back and fight back against his ghouls is because his trust in God stays consistent. He doesn't turn to the right. He doesn't turn to the left. He keeps his foot from evil and keeps marching forward. He consistently spends time with God. He talks with God. He serves God. And because of that... There's no confusion for Daniel when crap begins to hit the fan. Look at verse 10, which I really think, man, verse 10 is really the hinge pin of this whole story. Verse 10 reads like this, so now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he knew it had been published. He knew what was a part of it. Now when he had learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where his windows opened toward Jerusalem. And what did he do? Three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Now this phrase here at the end, just as he had done before, it's a Hebrew idiom. Right? The story is originally written in uh, Hebrew uh, because of the time period and the people that it was written for. And we have a little bit of trouble translating it into English because the words are kind of clunky. And so when we put it in English, we, we try several different ways to really carry the idea of what's going on here. And so several of the other translations, like, like the New Living Translations, translates it this way. It says that he, Daniel, prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. The New America Standard says praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. He was kneeling and offering prayers and thanks to his God, just as he had been accustomed to do previously. And then the King James Version says, as he did aforetime. I threw that one in there just because I wanted to use aforetime in a sermon. <laughs> the point is, though, Daniel was consistent in doing this. Praying, this, Daniel getting down in front of the window, praying three times, like this wasn't a one-time thing. For Daniel, this wasn't a, oh, oh, crap, man. Like, things are getting really bad out there. I guess I should start praying. For Daniel, it was, 
well, I guess I know what I'm talking about to God today. Daniel didn't wait for things to get bad to decide, man, I need to go start praying. Daniel was talking to God regularly. He was talking to God consistently. Daniel was consistent. He knew the decree. He knew that the lion's den was likely where he was going to end up, but he didn't get distracted. He didn't get distracted to the right or to the left. He stayed consistent. And that was a small thing that added up to something bigger. And that's what I want you to see from Daniel's story. These are things that we forget over time. It's small things, small decisions over long periods of time give us big results. That's Daniel's story. Small decisions over long periods of time gets him where he wants to go. Too often what happens, I think, for us is we don't stay consistent in our own spiritual lives or our own pursuit of God or our own pursuit of good. We get distracted. We get pulled to the right or to the left. And so what happens is we end up having to throw one of these. Check out this video. Dobbs heaves it. They're bunched up in the end zone. It's tipped up. It's caught. Now watch the way Tennessee responds to this. Look, running out. Look, the coach is crying. He's crying. Like, what is going on? The quarterback. Quarterback's laying at midfield, got his hands up on his head, like, what just happened? Wait, he caught it? So here's the deal. How many of you fans of football? You fans of college football, fans of football, anybody? All right. If you're any kind of fan of football, at some point in time, you have probably heard or been introduced to what's called the Hail Mary Pass. That's what that was, the Hail Mary Pass. And here's the thing. If you're a coach, if you're a player, uh, if, you've, if you, you know, consider yourself a pretty big football fan, you know one thing about the Hail Mary pass, it's not a good situation. Like, it's not a good situation to be in to have to throw a Hail Mary pass because what having to throw a Hail Mary pass means is that you did not do enough of the small things right throughout the game to put yourself in the place of having a high percentage of, of winning at the end. You didn't do enough of the small things right. So your only chance, your only hope is to drop back and pass, heave the ball in the air, and pray that it comes down in your favor. Like, that's the idea. And you can tell by the way that they react, the Hail Mary pass doesn't normally work. You know, they're, they're, they're dumbfounded when he comes down and he, he's actually caught the ball. They're so excited. Because when your team is the one that has to throw the Hail Mary pass, in your mind, what are you, you're already convinced of what? You're, you're already, yeah, you're already prepped for the loss. You understand, like, you feel like the loss is likely, and you hope that it comes down in your favor. You know, you're prepped for the loss, and you hope for the win. And isn't that the opposite of the way we'd want to live? Right? You don't want to be prepped for the loss and just kind of hope for the win. And so it's what happens, what I feel like, you hate to see your team have to throw the Hail Mary pass because you know that it doesn't usually work. A fun little side note, the University of Tennessee played Georgia two weeks ago, and it's like they showed up with the same game plan, and Georgia shut them out 41 to nothing. <laughs> so you don't want to be in a place where you have to throw a Hail Mary pass, but get this. How often, how often do we throw up spiritual Hail Mary passes because we're not spiritually consistent in our own lives and find ourselves in trouble? And so we end up praying, God, if you just fill in the blank, then I promise I'll fill in the blank. God, if you help me pass, God, if you help me get out of this, you can fill in those blanks with all kinds of things. And it's not bad, but isn't, we want to be we want to living in such a way that we don't have to get to that point where that's our only hope. And so the key is to not get lured off the path and seeing the good things that come from following and living out the wisdom so that we can slay and stand up against the ghouls that try and distract us to stay consistent and I think a lot of it is staying consistent with the small stuff. Daniel found a way to consistently pray, and that kept him from getting distracted by his ghouls. Often, I think we feel like that's what we're missing. It's like, well, I'm, I'm just not a consistent person. That's what I'm missing. I'm missing the consistency because I'm just not a, a consistent person. But here's the deal. Like, we are consistent people. I mean, if we're honest... If we're honest, when we had just have kind of a blunt, honest conversation, we are consistent people. We may not feel like a consistent person, but I think really what the problem is, is that we haven't prioritized our consistencies. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Don't you mean like we're not consistent with our priorities? No, I mean we haven't prioritized our consistencies. 
You see, you ask someone today how they're doing, right? And if they don't give you just the passing answer, the good, you know, or the, uh, or the well, you know, I, won't, I can't complain. If they won't give you one of those passing answers, you say, how are things going? And they give you an answer. What do they usually say? Man, I'm just so busy. I'm just so busy. And as you, you ask them what they're busy with or you learn what they're busy with, they're busy with things that take what? They're busy with things that take consistency. We are consistent people. We just haven't prioritized the things that we're consistent with. And here's the deal. Our consistencies reveal our priorities. The things we're consistent with reveal what are our priority in our life. Someone who consistently goes and works out, as someone who consistently eats well, you'd say health and fitness is a priority for them, right? Someone, a coworker who continually goes to volunteer personal development, you would say advancement and learning is a priority for them, right? We can say, man, my kids are one of the most important things in my life. They're, they're a priority, but if I constantly spend more time at happy hour with my buddies instead of hangout time with the family, well, it's not actually a priority, right? Our consistency reveal our priorities. Bettering, if bettering your marriage is, is something that you want, if that's a priority that you want, maybe you need to look at your consistencies and reprioritize. Maybe we need to cut out some of the shows where we sit on a couch side by side and stare at a screen together. Cut out the shows and turn towards each other and actually have a conversation about what is and isn't going on. If you want to know the Bible better or learn more about the Bible, maybe you need to look at your consistencies and reprioritize. Set the alarm 10 minutes earlier, 15 minutes earlier. Maybe go to bed 10, 15 minutes later so that you can spend some time reading your YouVersion app on, the, on your smartphone or reading a proverb out of, Bi- uh, out of the book of Proverbs in the Bible. You hear people talk about Jesus giving hope, right? Like that Jesus gives us peace. And, and you show up at church thinking, perhaps, maybe he does. And so you come to church once or twice, or you, but maybe you just need to give some consistency. You know, you go to Mo Group, where there are groups of like 6 to 12 people that meet in people's home throughout the week, where you can get to know one another in the room and have someone to kind of help encourage you through life, to help you get better. But you've got to give it some consistency to see some fruit from it. And so the question that I want you to ask, and I want you to be thinking about this week, I want you thinking about the rest of this day, is what are you consistent at? What are, what are, what are your consistencies? What are the things that you're going to go through this week and you know for sure you're not going to miss those things? You know that you're going to be doing them. And some of, then the follow-up question is, what consistencies do you need to stop so you can start the ones that matter? What consistency do you need to stop so you can start a consistency with the thing you want to be a priority? Some questions to help prime that pump. What's the first thing you do in the morning? Right? So these are just questions to think about. What's the first thing you do in the morning? What's the last thing you do before you go to bed? What are the things that you do through the lulls in your day? What do you do while you're driving if you've got a long commute? If you've got a short commute, what do you do while you're driving? What do you do while you're sitting at a stoplight? Maybe that's where you can inject a new consistency so that something that you want to be a priority can actually become a priority. Daniel was consistent, and because of that, he was able to stand up to his ghouls, and Daniel was able to resist his ghouls by being intentional. He was very intentionally consistent. He said when Daniel knew that the decree was signed, he went to his room and he intentionally prayed. So the question is, what can you do intentionally to resist the distraction the ghouls are trying to get you with? What are the things that you can do intentionally to resist the distractions the ghouls are trying to get you with? Do you need to stop keeping your phone on your nightstand so in the middle of the night you're perusing things you shouldn't be? Do you need to cut out some social media for some time? Do you need to cut out some people who just want to feed the anger and not help you get better? They're just helping you get bitter and not better. Do you want to read your Bible every day? Maybe you need to set an alarm. Maybe you need to change the music that you listen to so it stops feeding that anger or that depression. Man, one of the things that a good buddy of mine, uh, Michael Bartlett, the guy who started Collective Church, we celebrated over the last couple weeks, one of the things he really challenged me to do a couple weeks ago is I'm now trying intentionally to start my day with zero screen time. I don't check my messages. I don't check social media until I spend some time in the Bible. And in the morning, I spend some quick time. 
uh, in the Bible. And what I do is I read whatever date it is corresponding to the book of Proverbs. And I try and memorize the one verse that is really sticking out to me because Proverbs is just a collection of wise sayings. And so there's always something applicable to what you're going through. And so I try and memorize the one verse that seems most applicable. And I'm trying intentionally to do that before I do any other screen time. Uh, and that wasn't so difficult at first. And then we got into postseason baseball. And now I just want to wake up and see what the scores are. Um, but not so much anymore. Moment of silence for our Indians. Thank you. Um, I'm on team anybody but the Yankees now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. But it's a small thing, okay? I get it, man. Starting the day without any... It's a small thing. But... I'm already noticing some bigger results from it. The other thing that he challenged me to do, he said, listen to one worship song. Just, just change, because I, I don't typically listen to worship music. I, I've got my playlists on Pandora and Spotify, and that's what I listen to. He said, just try and listen to one worship song before you start your work day. Once again, really small thing, but I'm noticing already a big difference because it just puts me in a better mindset as I'm starting my day. Those are small things, but they're beginning to add up and make a big difference. And they're things that I can intentionally be consistent with. Daniel was intentionally consistent with praying. So what are things that you can do to be intentionally consistent? Jeremiah 6.16 says this. This is what the Lord says. It says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. This is a message that God is delivering through his prophet, Jeremiah, another messenger. He's going to the people because the people have openly said, God, we're not going to do what you want us to do. And they're starting to suffer for it. And so they're like, hey, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? So Jeremiah comes to him and he says, this is what God says to do. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And when you begin walking in it, you will find rest for your souls. That's what we want. I mean, I would love, I would love to be able to stand up here and give you some awesome, like, new fad way to make this easy. But what this verse highlights, what the story of Daniel highlights, what Proverbs highlights, this is not some new fad. Like, it just comes down to we've got to make time. Old truths trump fads every time. And that's what we get from these stories. In ancient folklore, Ghouls were actually pretty easy to defeat. If you, if you were walking, traveling down the road, and you got yourself distracted, and, and the ghoul popped up and showed itself, the way you would defeat the ghoul is you take your sword, and you would slash it one time across its belly, across its midsection. If you, if, you slash, if you slashed it anywhere but its belly, or you slashed it more than once, the ghoul would come back with twice as much rage. And so what you had to do is the key to defeating the ghoul was being prepared was understanding that it may show up. And when you were prepared for it, intentionally consistent, you were ready for it so you could intentionally strike it down, that one slash across the midsection. When we stay intentionally consistent, that same is true for our spiritual path. We have to intentionally and consistently spend time with God so we won't be so easily tempted to be pulled off the path to the right or to the left. That's what I want you to wrestle through and think through. What do I need to, re how do I need to reprioritize my consistencies so that my priority is staying on that path, is not getting distracted from the good that God wants for me? Let's pray. God, we love you. God, thanks for loving us. God, I pray that you be with us with this message this morning. God, thanks for the simple reminder that uh, you've got a path that you want for us. Uh, God, help us to not get distracted. It's so easy uh, to sit in here, be inspired in a moment, and then, God, the week is tough as we go through the rest of the week. But God, ask that you be with us. God, help us to find ways to intentionally be consistent. Uh, God, help us to have, give us wisdom as we sit down and we, we look at what our priorities are, the things that we're already consistent with. And God, help us to cut out the ones that, that are, are distracting us. And God, help us to replace them with the ones that will help us head in the direction that we want to head in to where uh, our relationship with you, our families, our, our work is a priority and in the appropriate place. God, we love you deeply. And it's in your son's holy and awesome name we pray.